Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics, a podcast dedicated to exploring how things get places and the people who get them there. We'll talk with logistics and supply chain leaders about innovation, industry trends, and the future of the logistics business. Now, here's your host, Joe Lynch. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics podcast. My name is Joe Lynch. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today's topic is supply chain lessons from Northwest Arkansas with my friend, Donnie Williams. How's it going, Donnie? Uh, Doing well, Joe. I appreciate you having me on the podcast. Oh, I'm excited to have you on my podcast. We've been blabbing about uh, this topic and other things for a while, so I'm excited to finally do this. Donnie, please introduce yourself and your organization. Sure. Again, Joe, thank you for having me. I'm Donnie Williams. I'm an assistant professor of logistics and supply chain management at the Walton College at the University of Arkansas. And I also have the pleasure of being the executive director of the Supply Chain Management Research Center in the Walton College. And in that role, I get to be a connector between our supply chain program, which shameless plug here is to rank the number one supply chain program in North America by Gartner. Very nice. But I get to be the, yeah, uh, so we're pretty proud of that right now. And so we're hoping we maintain that spot this summer when the rankings come out again. But I get to play the connector between our industry partners here in Northwest Arkansas and around the country with our faculty students, PhD students, master students. And, and so it's just a real joy to work here. Yeah. And that's actually how I got connected with you. Ron Richardson from Turvo said, oh, right. Joe, you, my son is in that University of Arkansas program. And I was like, okay, tell me more. And then he said, it's one of the top logistics, one of the top supply chain schools in the country. And he says, you got to talk to Donnie Williams. So here we are. Yeah. And by the way, Ron is a proud Michigan State uh, Spartan. And I know they also have a claim to fame on a supply chain. I, I think it's amazing how many supply chain programs there are now. Yeah. And I joke about it, but I remember probably 25 years ago, some recruiter was calling me and saying, really need a supply chain guy like you. Uh, you'd be a perfect fit. I kept saying, what the hell? I was saying, what's supply chain? I, it made no <laughs> sense to me what he was talking about. I was one. I just didn't recognize myself as a supply chain guy. And now here it is. You guys are turning into not just an art, but a science. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, it's just, I, I arrived here three years ago. I was at a small liberal arts college in the middle of Georgia called Georgia College of State University. We had a uh, logistics and supply chain program for 40 years that really served Robbins Air Force Base there. But the opportunity to come here to the University of Arkansas, work with Dean Matt Waller, who, uh, if you don't know, won the CSCMP Service Award uh, two years ago. You know, he's just a, a great leader in our academic industry and the industry overall. To work with him, Brian Fugit, who's the department chair here, and Brent Williams and all the other great faculty we have here. I couldn't pass that up. And so my wife and I love it here now. And so we're just, we're fully in, put our roots down here in Northwest Arkansas and just excited to be a part of the program. So we'll get back to why we say Northwest Arkansas rather than just Arkansas in a minute. Okay. But uh, yeah. <laughs> Donnie, please, <laughs> please, um, please tell us a little bit about you. Where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to school? Give us some career highlights before you joined up over at University of Arkansas. Well, so I'm a Georgia boy at heart, and so finally got some things to root about this past year with the Braves winning the World Series and oh, yeah, my dogs. The... Yeah, my dogs finally winning the national championship. So. And they, they whomped my Michigan Wolverines this year. They... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry for all your listeners up there in Michigan, but yeah, it was Georgia's year, right? <laughs> we were pretty happy. It's uh, not a bad way to be, to be number three. I'll take it. <laughs> that's right. That's right. It felt like there was only two elite teams there at the end of the year. There was Alabama and Georgia, and and then I'd, I'd call Michigan and Ohio State distant, the third, fourth. Don't play at that same level. Sorry, Cincinnati, you're not in that. <laughs> you're not in that next tier either. That's right. Well, and so so anyway, I'm I'm from Georgia, born and raised in southeast Georgia, about a little town called Statesboro, Georgia, and you may have heard of it. Georgia Southern University is there. That's actually where I ended up doing my undergrad, master's, and PhD. I was a late, uh, I went back to school at 30 years old because I worked in construction and I did some other things, worked in some warehousing. And I was actually a project manager for commercial construction. And I was actually working at Georgia Southern University, managing their new construction buildings and renovations and, and all of that. 
in my master's program. And so at in that role, I was always a customer of supply chain, right? So you kind of think about big construction projects. When you're managing those, boy, the seven hours of logistics come into play pretty quick, right? So I need the right products at the right place at the right time because I've got a building to turn over to this customer. Right. And so when I was doing my master's, I kind of had this idea that I wanted to uh, get a PhD and at some point be a professor. I thought that that would be in just management, right? Because that's what I was doing, project management. But then I was in my master's class and was taking operations management. We started talking about supply chain. I was like, huh. To your point, it wasn't really wasn't a thing a prominent word, right? And so I was like, well, what is this supply chain thing? And so the more, of course, in the textbooks, everybody talks about it from a product perspective, right? And so you and I have been talking about, you know, in general, how really we can go back to Henry Ford and the automobile production, right? So manufacturing and kind of, you know, how the supply chain kind of works out with that. Interestingly enough, Henry Ford was fully vertically integrated. And then we kind of have the outsourcing movement, right? So we focus on our core competency and then kind of outsource everything else. And so, but from a project manager's perspective in the construction industry, looking at this was really a blessing for me because it just gave me a different perspective of what right. was happening. Because I don't know how much you know about the construction industry, but one of the things I really loved every day was having to bring people together to collaborate, to actually execute something, whether you're talking about architects, engineers, the project managers, the inspectors, the general contractors who are going to do the work and then their subcontractors. So I'm talking about in my world, I'm looking at when I begin to look and understand supply chain, I'm like, well, these are my tier one, tier two, tier three suppliers, right? <laughs> and so, right. and then they've got all these goods coming from all over the world that have to arrive on this spot, you know, on this own location at the right time to be able to execute and build together. And so, so it's really fun for me to kind of look at that perspective. I actually think it's helped me coming in now that what we call the retail supply chain to kind of see things more oh, yeah. systemically that way. And I fell in love with it in the master's program, decided to do my PhD. Georgia Southern was starting a PhD program in it at the time when I was finishing my master's and said, Hey, let's, let's do this. And so so all my degrees are at Georgia Southern, which is unusual. And most people would say, don't do that. And so, but I'm like, you know what? It ended up working out well for me. Yeah, it worked out. And that's where you live. That's I, I always feel like the, and if you started at 30, but it, it's a little difficult to say, yeah, I'm going to switch gears and move the whole family around from place that's to right. place. You know, it's interesting when we talk about supply chain, we talk about different companies. So if you look at automotive companies, they always say, oh, those are manufacturing companies. Yeah. Why are they manufacturing companies? Because they manufacture stuff. Right. Well, they're also, they engineer stuff. They, the heavy duty engineering goes into developing a vehicle. Apple is not a manufacturing company. They're a tech company. Virtually any other, so, so you look at Walmart, they, they're a retail company, but nobody calls themselves a supply chain company. And by the way, automotive we always had purchasing, which was super important. We always had logistics was super important. And we always had people who managed suppliers, supplier development, supplier management, all these different sub supplier quality, in incoming quality. There was tons of supplier stuff. Uh, we never had it all under one group called supply chain. I suspect they do now. But it's interesting. In the olden days, companies like Ford or General Motors, some of these companies would say, we are going to do it all ourselves, vertically integrated. And then they got to a place where they're still doing the final assembly, but so much of it is now shipped in, you know, so they'll get systems. So there's body systems that are shipped in, you know, com e even painted. That's right. And you could right now say, yeah, we're calling them manufacturing companies still, but you could call them supply chain companies. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a fair assessment. And I think, you know, the specialization that has happened and, and we know that happened before efficiency reasons, right? That... If I focus on doing one thing and that one thing well, I can become really efficient at it. When Henry Ford proved this on the production line, right, and the assembly line, right? So I can take a worker. They're going to do this one thing. Well, now if I extrapolate that across supply chains or across companies and organizations that, hey, you're going to specialize in this, then they can do it more efficiently. Yeah, it's funny. I did a lot of lean and value stream mapping in automotive, and the Japanese really kind of popularized lean Toyota, the Toyota way. So we all studied all that when I was in automotive still. And what was interesting is they would always say, Henry Ford invented lean. They would say that. But I think modern day lean 
value stream mapping, they kind of took that over. And I know we've added Six Sigma to that since then. But we did lean within four walls, which sit within our factories. And then it grew. So when I was doing value stream mapping or lean, we were doing it from order to cash. So we were doing entire supply chains. And that was a fantastic opportunity because you get to see every last handoff, every last email. And so much of the supply chain now is information exchange. Yes. And it was fascinating. It's a cool way, to, cool, cool way to learn that order to cash. And by the way, for those of you saying, oh, I, I know what lean is, uh, kind of, but not, I always used to say, just to keep it real simple, from the time I get the order to the time I get paid is my pr- process. And all I'm doing with lean is saying, Take out time, take out waste. Every every extra step I have cost me money. So that's just make it real simple on yourself. <laughs> and you know, and I would want the listeners to understand too. Lean's got a bad rap, you know, through the pandemic. And so, just kind of a quick plug here is that it's because people that are saying lean is a problem don't understand lean. <laughs> so they're they're equating lean with low inventory. And and that's just absolutely not correct. Lean is the amount, right amount of inventory, right? It's having the right amount of inventory in place, and so yeah. Years ago, I attended a, a workshop. I was at, I was an observer, so this friend of mine, Harry, was doing this, and he said he got up at the and he said, "I've learned. Um, I'm a lean guy. I'm a Six Sigma guy. I'm this guy." So he went through all the all of his different trainings. He said, and then he goes, "Actually." I take that back. I'm a recovering lean guy. I'm a recovering Six Sigma guy. I'm a recover- <laughs> and, he, and he says, now they're just tools. He said, for a while I walked around with them and that's that was the hammer I had in my hand and everything was a nail. <laughs> you know, Peter Singh wrote a book called The Fifth Discipline. And he brings a really important point about this from W.E. Deming, who we call the father of yep. the total quality movement, right? And so, and and I think there's a real lesson here for all of us. And I, I make my students read an article about this it's called It's the Learning, the Real Lessons of the Total Quality Movement. W. Deming actually hated that phrase, total quality management. Right. Because he believed it stopped people from thinking, which is what the real secret sauce was, right? With lean, with, with any of these tools, it's how do I get people to actually start thinking about processes end to end so that they can understand and identify where Problems are inherent. Same idea we get with the goal, right? So you go back to gold rat's goal. I want people to think. And if they do, then they'll continually learn. And then they continue to solve those problems. And so. I'm in Michigan and Deming did a lot of work. And I think where he became popular was right after World War II. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Japanese really embraced his what he was doing because they wanted to rebuild their industries. And they took what he what he taught them and went crazy and the and American they, companies they, didn't they, want to hear what he had to yes, say. Yes, <laughs> exactly. They they reinvented manufacturing, made it better. And if it wasn't for the Japanese doing that, I don't know where the world would be because we so we copied that. So years ago, I was on like a board of trustees for my old university, University Cleary University was where I got my undergrad. And so they said, hey, we're going to we're going to open this new building. We're going to dedicate it and we're going to call it the Deming building. It's going to be all about quality. And and being the big mouth I am, I said, (laughs) well, you better hurry. He's not getting any younger. (laughs) So we met like a month later. And in the meantime, he died. (laughs) And so so it's like we got in there. There's a little bit of silence. And somebody goes, way to go, Joe. (laughs) (laughs) I was like... I shouldn't have said it. I know, but he was old, man. (laughs) Anyway, Donnie, let's switch gears and talk about supply chain lessons from Northwest Arkansas. First off, why am I hearing Northwest Arkansas? And by the way, my sister lived overseas for many years, 18 years. So she always lived with Walmart people, always lived with China, Brazil, Mexico, South Africa. And she says, wherever you go, there's always Walmart people. And she says, and they're not from Arkansas. They're from Northwest Arkansas. <laughs> so tell me, why do we hear Northwest Arkansas? You know, it's something that I learned. I moved here three years ago, uh, January 19. And so all I knew is I was moving to Fayetteville or Bentonville. And, and Walmart's in Bentonville and then University of Arkansas is in Fayetteville. And so I was still kind of learning the area. But I think it's because Northwest Arkansas is up here in this corner. It's kind of a plateau. And you've got the Boston Mountains and really the Ozarks. 
and kind of cut across the state. And so up here in this northwest corner, you've got these just this area that has really grown up together. And it's because, to put it frank, you've got four entities right here, right? You've got Walmart up in Bentonville. You got Tyson Chicken, Tyson Poultry, which is in Springdale. And you've got J.B. Hunt, which is in Lowell, uh, just south of Rogers. And of course, the first Walmart itself was actually built in Rogers, Arkansas, not uh, Bentonville, like many people think. So Ark Best is up there too, right? Ark Best is just, actually, Ark Best is just south, right? So it's about 40 miles south. Oh, no. Are they in so- southwest Arkansas? Don't, well, don't no, no, no. Don't start uh, with that. <laughs> they're still, they're still kind of in the more northern part of western Arkansas. But, you know, they're close uh, enough to really be a, a player here in northwest Arkansas as well. There's actually, if you're coming up I-49, uh, there's a tunnel that you have to go through driving through the mountains. And everybody always says, once you go through that tunnel, you've arrived in Northwest Arkansas. And so that's where basically the street turns to gold and everything's that's kind right. of, uh, the colors are brighter. And uh, <laughs> well, it's funny, a, a guy I used to work with, Bill Hall, used to say, he goes, he, he goes, have you been to Northwest Arkansas? I said, no. He goes, he goes, you know, I like I like Southeast Arkansas. He, he's a hunter. And he goes, I love that area. He goes, no one ever talks about Southeast Arkansas. He goes, it's a great place too. He must love duck hunting then because if you get near Stump Guard, Arkansas, which is in the southern part of Arkansas, then that's the duck hunting capital of the world. And so it's just amazing. I was watching, actually, I was driving back to Georgia last year and watching the migration of the ducks come down. It's just amazing to watch. Yep. So, Donnie, when we, we want to talk today about supply chain lessons from Northwest Arkansas, and I think anyone who's paid attention to what's gone on in retail over the last what, 50 years, sure, really, really the last 20 years um, for the whole nation, Walmart has taken off. And you, uh, you mentioned these other companies that are also in Northwest Arkansas, which is J.B. Hunt, obviously very successful trucking company, Arc Best, another tr- very successful trucking company, and uh, Tyson Foods. Or Tyson, Tyson chicken, but I know there's some more than just chicken at this point. And when we talked offline, you said uh, there's just some unique lessons that have been learned here, and that can be kind of replicated elsewhere. But uh, at least if you're going to understand logistics and supply chain, it's helpful to understand what some of the best supply chains are doing. So that's right. Let's talk. We, we I think we identified five of them. So let's talk about the five lessons we can learn from Northwest Arkansas and all the players up there. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. So what's the first one? Well, and I think the first one is that uh, I don't remember the order <laughs> that you had it on your list. I'd there, co-lo- but, uh, <laughs> I'd co-location is <laughs> so, the first one. Yeah, yeah. So and I think you know that's the point, right? Is that you know we've been studying Walmart for a number of years. If you're studying supply chain in general from an academic perspective, you're looking at Henry Ford. You know, your world up there with the auto industry. The next one we look at now in modern is oh, yeah. Walmart. You know, what what Sam Walton did, his strategy to keep costs low by integrating both warehousing and trucking within his own firm. So there's an element there that we talk about with vertical integration that he did. And if I can cut out that middleman, I can keep those costs low. But I can also buy more products by putting it in my distribution centers and doing that. So we've studied that for years, right? And this is this is how Walmart became Walmart. Sam was just a very shrewd businessman and he was he was wise. He understood and, how and, to and part of that co location is co location with all his suppliers. So if you're a supplier and let's face it, a lot of the Fortune five hundred our companies are suppliers and they end up living yeah. at least they, I should take that all of them. They end up with offices in Northwest Arkansas, and that's because they're they're collaborating, they're innovating, they're working closely with Walmart, and that's where that co location ends up adding value. You know, we are all used to working remote right now, which is fine, but let's face it: the nature of working remote is you jump on a call for an hour, you go into the office one day a week or one day a month. And some of the informal stuff, some of the casual conversations are lost. When you have an office in Northwest Arkansas, and let's just say you're one of the big CPGs, your purpose is to go see the boss, Walmart. (laughs) Well, you know, and I think that grew. And I think, you know, part of what I was just kind of building to there is as Walmart began to grow, they weren't a major player, right? (laughs) So they were competing against Kmart, Sears, and some of these other 
big companies. But that rapid growth, always, you know, so Procter & Gamble was the first one. And they probably helped themselves quite a bit by doing so. Oh, yeah, they did. And, you know, interestingly enough, Procter & Gamble's offices here are in Fayetteville. And so not Bentonville or Rogers now. But, you know, they collaborated. They were one of the most strategic suppliers with Walmart. They invented with Walmart, co-invented CPFR, as we know it today. Wait, wait, what is that? It's collaborative planning, forecasting, and replenishment. And so how can I take the point of sale data and get it to my suppliers as quick as possible so that they know how much inventory is coming through and is needed in the system? So how do I collaborate together? But if you think about it, what is it, CPFR? And so Don Bechtel, who's actually executive in residence here, was with P&G at the time and helped develop that. And one of the things that they he, he made sure that they talked about is like, it's not enough just to do forecasting together. We have to plan together. And so this gets to this idea of like real collaboration between companies where, hey, we're not working against one another. We're working with one another to win that final customer. So we're, we're so this is that kind of idea that we talk about where you really begin to get in this uh, thing where it's not companies competing against one another, it's supply chains competing against one another. Right. And so, well, certainly Procter & Gamble's the first, right, that they have an office here. Well, now there's over 1,500 suppliers that have 1500. offices here. Yeah, here in Northwest Arkansas. And we're not talking about small offices either. We're talking about teams of 25, 50, and some, in many cases, hundreds of people with these suppliers that, that are here to serve Walmart as their customer and, you know, plan together, collaborate together, and work together. Now, what happens with that, that co-location that you're talking about? I'll give you a great story about this. So I was, um, before I moved here, I would tell people, you know, they'd ask me, hey, what do you do for a living? Well, I'm a professor. Well, what do you teach? Supply chain management. What is that? <laughs> so, no idea, right? <clears throat> so I was used to having my spill together. Hey, here's what supply chain management is. I moved here three years ago, and I'm kind of out and about in the community, and someone would ask me, hey, what do you do? Well, I'm a professor at the university. Well, what do you teach? Supply chain management. Oh, okay. Everybody knew what supply chain was because either their wife worked for one of the suppliers or they worked for Walmart or they worked for J.B. Hunt or their best friend did or something like that. So, yeah, that's I'm, I'm, I'm an automotive guy, as you know, and uh, originally. And that has been something we've done in automotive for a long time is if you're going to. And by the way, that kind of when you co-locate, that means, hey, we're, we're opening an office in Mexico City and we need you to be we need you to have a presence there or we need you to have a facility there, maybe a, maybe in production facilities there. Um, if we're moving to if we're moving to Europe, if we're moving to China. So so after a while, it became important to have that co-location. And by the way, as a product development guy, I spent when you're in the in, in a Ford building or General Motors, Stellantis, Nissan, any of these buildings, so often there are suppliers that are part of that development process. So it's hard to say who's who. And that's right. That again, I think the nature of that co-location is better understanding your customer, better but better understanding, you know, just the casual stuff. And I'll throw this out there. This also speaks to something that I'm near near and dear to me is I never like the idea of transactional partners. So I always say, we're not going to date. We're not going to be engaged. We're getting married. And when you say that somebody's co-locating, they aren't going to co-locate. Procter & Gamble wasn't co-locating there on a whim. I suspect they said, we're talking to Walmart and Walmart's going to make this commitment to us and we're going to make this commitment to Walmart and we're going to be hand in glove here. We are going to work together for a good long time. And if I'm going to put a whole bunch of people there, that's what the expectation is. And that means you've got to vet people. That means, you, you know, vet, vet companies. It also means you probably weed out people who can't make a commitment. It also weeds out companies that are maybe too small to make a commitment. If some, they can't deliver on the uh, promise that they make, they can't be part of the uh, co-location. It's just not the nature of the beast. And, you know, one of the really interesting kind of phenomena that I've noticed here is you know, Walmart gets a bad rap in the press and things like that. You know, they don't treat people well. You know, I'm like, no, nah, you don't understand. Like, I've talked to so many people that have worked for Walmart over years, and I cannot recall one person that had a negative experience working for Walmart. Yeah. Almost all of them like, this is the, this is just a great place to work. I've learned so much. They invest in me. They give me our opportunities. But even more than that, amongst the suppliers, 
I never hear negative things talked about, like ever. I have ne- ever heard it. And so, uh, and so it's just a real collaborative environment because what happens, you know, Walmart, like every big company goes through a restructure every now and then, you know, they, they change direction. So, and I've watched this personally. Last year, there was a massive restructure. Greg Smith, who was the EVP of supply chain left. Jeff England, who was SVP of supply chain in my leadership class. He'd been with Walmart for 17 years. He's now with Napa as the EVP of uh, supply chain for them. But one of the things that I always found is that everyone is grateful for the opportunity Walmart gave them. And many of them end up going and working for suppliers or, or other, other companies. Many of them stay in this area and really help the suppliers understand how to work better with Walmart. And so you have this kind of unique kind of collaborative environment where everybody kind of knows everybody and they're working together and they're trying to solve the problems together. Right. You know, it's interesting. I think one of the challenges with, with you know, when you said people, Walmart gets a bad rap. Um, one thing I will also uh, say is I read an article years ago and it said there was probably no company in, in the history of the world that has done more for um, poor people than Walmart because that those always low prices. That's no joke. They are delivering on that. I think Aldi would some Aldi's growing and probably saying, Hey, we're right there. Right. And I'll throw one other thing out there is people say, yeah, but they don't pay their uh, people well enough to live. If you're working retail, I do know Walmart has a policy of saying whatever metropolitan region we are in, we will be the highest paid retail workers. I know one of the challenges we always have here in America is we want we want the olden days where somebody could get out of high school, go work at a factory and make a really good living. And now we want retail to replace that. And I joke about it on my podcast, govern, government people, if you run for office, politicians, they have a manufacturing fetish. They think we're going to go back to being, hey, I'm going to get a, a job in manufacturing and I'm going to make a hundred grand a year. Those gays are gone, not only here, they're gone worldwide. Yeah. We are using automation. So, and retail, it's uh, one of the jobs you don't necessarily need a degree for, is not going to replace that. It, and especially at Walmart, where the focus is on how do we keep the cost low? Because that's that's their mission. Which brings us to the next point, which was understanding the why. You told me that that was one of the lessons you've learned from Northwest Arkansas. Well, I've, I learned it. Before I got here, because I knew Sam's. Yeah, yeah, you were a PhD before you got there. Yeah, so, so, (laughs) well, and and again, you study, and actually, before I was a PhD, I studied Sam Walton. In my master's program, I was, I was studying him. And one of the fascinating things about me was Sam, and because how does a guy, you know, Southwest Missouri, which is where Sam grew up, become, receive the Presidential Medal of Honor, right? (laughs) For, you know, for, Walmart. How does that, how does that happen? Sam grew up in the Dust Bowl in the depression. And so Sam grew up in poverty and, and his mission, and a lot of people don't know his story, right? But, you know, he grew up in Southwest Missouri and poor, his family was poor. He watched poverty all around him. And so his mission became, how can I raise the lifestyle of the poor? How can I give them access to goods so that they they can live better lives? That is still the mission of Walmart today, right? And so they deviated from that a couple of times, kind of in the early yeah, 2000s. And I want to point out, not just poor people are going there, but it is, if you contrast their demographics there and say Costco, yeah. Costco's got a pretty wealthy clientele. I think it's over $100,000 a year on average. Walmart is much lower, but they, again, I've, I've shopped there. I'm, I'm not... Uh, I'm not poor, but I love those low prices. <laughs> well, and, and I think, but and everybody does, right? And so, and everybody's like, well, you know, they got low prices because they pay their employees not very well. That's absolutely not true. <laughs> so, it's a talking point, but it's absolutely not true. I think, I can't remember if it's Walmart or Warren Buffett, but both of them have created an incredible amount of millionaires uh, throughout their lives. And I can tell you, you know, we were talking about those manufacturing jobs, where those manufacturing jobs went, they went into supply chain. Because supply chain folks are paid pretty doggone well. And so we move a lot of stuff now and we store a lot of stuff and we facilitate the movement of those goods. And by the way, the country still produces the second most amount of goods in the world today. We still manufacture a lot of crap. <laughs> and so, and, the, the, di- the difference is, you know, in the, in the olden days, we didn't have the automation. Now, if you look, so if you look at the investment per employee, it, it, it's 
10 times what it once was. So, and thank God it is, because if you ever go into a tr true manufacturing environment, those people would go to work. And I think that's where the manufacturing fetish breaks down. If you go, sure. hey, I'm going to call my grandpa who worked at a manufacturing plant and say, hey, back in the good old days when you worked at that plant, he's not going to talk to you about good old days. He's going to say, you could go to the work, you could get hurt, you were going to get tired, you were going to get dirty, you were going to get sweaty, not pushing papers around like what we do or clicking on computers all day. One other thing I'll throw out there about Walmart, if you look, I think they're responsible for 10% of the imports from China. I haven't looked lately. In the last generation, 50%, or I should say 500 million people in China came out of abject poverty and became middle class. That's right. Walmart is responsible for 10% of that. So you could say easily 10% of China's poorest of the poor are no longer there. And somebody, somebody might say, oh, I don't care about China, but it doesn't help us to have poor neighbors. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> right. That's right. And, you know, to the point about why, again, it's like, you know, Sam understood his why. Every decision he made in business was about the why. Why do I own my trucks? Why do I own my own DCs? And why am I doing this? So because if I can save money there, I can pass that on to the customer. I can raise that lifestyle. And, you know, to to the point, you know, we talked about this. I think it was the early, mid, early 2000s. You know, Walmart was watching Target, you know, and we could kind of see right. that there was this little, hey, we don't want to target, you know, we're ultra competitive, right? We want to keep our market. Share. FOMO. <laughs> right, right. And so, so if you, for those of you, many of your listeners may remember. That means this. fear of missing out, by the way. Right, right, right. So many of your listeners may remember this. There were certain brands that started popping up at Walmart. And so they started elevating their brands a bit to a little bit, particularly in like clothing and, and places like this. And to really compete with Target is what they were doing. And for the first time in their history, they started slowing down in their market share. And so they were like, hmm, this isn't working. And then there was an ad campaign that came out called Back to Basics. And I remember that vividly. Like, I think it was around 2008 or 2009. It's like Walmart was going back to their basics, being the low cost provider. And so, again, with all of that that happened, they still went back to their why. And they talked about Sam, our founder, right? And even today, when you hear uh, the leadership at Walmart and talk, they, they go back to Sam. This is what Sam's values were. This is what Sam wanted because they understood they're successful because Sam understood his why. And that has never left the company. Yep. And if I could throw one thing in there, I'm, I'm, I'm in Michigan where we had Kmart. Kmart's no longer, I don't think. But um, I know that every once in a while you hear a store close, another store close. Now I think there's one somewhere. But <laughs> Walmart and Kmart were in basically different planets. They were in different worlds. They were so far away from each other. As Kmart grew out of the Midwest, their their whole thing is they would send you circulars. So you would get these things in the mail on we're having a blue light special on this. We're having a blue light special. And the blue light special was literally that. Somebody pushing a cart with a blue siren and <laughs> <laughs> through the through the store, the blue light special. So you'd run and you'd go get something very inexpensive. Those circulars, those advertising circulars were very expensive. Managing your inventory that way is also expensive because you don't know what you're selling on any given day. If you look at Walmart, they don't do a lot of coupon stuff. They, they are focused on always low prices. So they are saying, so what they what they did a long time ago, pre-internet even, there was a time, they focused on, let's manage our inventory really well. Much And when you want to manage your inventory really well, you don't do sales. That's right. And if you want to manage, you want to keep your costs down, you don't do expensive mailings to everybody, sending them. So it's interesting, operational excellence is part of that mission. So Walmart has always been exceptional. And by the way, late, as of late, I think, I don't know this. I didn't ask when we were prepping. I think Walmart was the ones who said on time and in full, OTIF, which became. They were the drivers. It's the industry standard now, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's a, a religion. I'm not positive, but I think it's a religion now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so they put a lot so of pressure on So on time and in full is just one more drive towards operational excellence, which is really woven into everything we're going to talk about here because, and so is innovation. So you can't deliver on that message of how do we, and again, understanding your why, your, your why is to deliver this promise of uh, serving the, the poorest, poorest people in the country along with the rest of us. <laughs> I don't want anything, anyone listening say it's only poor people go there. <laughs> is being operationally excellent. And that, that and you mentioned owning some of their own 
assets and having their own warehouses. That was part of that mission. I suspect if it it stops being part of, if it doesn't work, they'll get rid of them. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And and to your point, so that that other lesson that we were talking about was that they're constantly pushing innovation. Yes. So, which is really fascinating to me because most people think about, well, you can't be low cost and push innovation. And I say, no, you absolutely have to be innovative if you're going to remain low cost <laughs> in today's world. Right. And so and so and that's true with all the companies here that, you know, we got the Fortune 500, the three big anchors here in northwest Arkansas. With, we've already talked to them about J.B. Hunt, Tyson and and Walmart. Walmart is becoming a digital company. Right. And that. They recognize that, that they have to be that. They've created the culture for that. We'll get to that later. But they have certainly said, we are not going to stop with the status quo. We're going to keep innovating. We're going to keep pushing so that we can serve our customers the best way possible. J.B. Hunt, same thing. In fact, Shelly Simpson, who see chief uh, people officer there. I want to get her on my podcast. She was supposed to be on and we, we I don't know what happened to our calendar on that, but I'll have to double check. She's a great guest. I mean, she's yeah. just an awesome person just in general, just as genuine and just a great leader for, for the company. But you know what? She has this kind of thing like we disrupt ourselves. We're constantly, how can we disrupt ourselves? So the whole JB Hunt 360 thing that came out and they've continued to tweak that and push that, push the envelope with it. We talked about, you know, when COVID hit, uh, they were the first ones that came out with the electronic bills of lading to help processes be easier for their drivers and for their customers. And so so they're constantly pushing that envelope. They would consider themselves a digital company. I, you know, you and I didn't even talk about Transplace, which, by the way, is oh, that's up right. here. They're, they're that. here in, yeah, they're here in Rogers. Their headquarters is in Dallas, but their largest office is here in northwest Arkansas. And, you know, they're managing, what is $12 billion of freight right now? <laughs> so their, their transportation management spend is bigger than Walmart's uh, and what they're doing. But they, they too, they're a digital company. They were just bought out by Uber over the last, this past year. Yep. And they're kind of in that process right now. Tyson, a protein company, right? And so they they recognize we're more than just meat, right? So they're constantly more than just poultry. Boundaries. More than just poultry. So they acquired. I mean, Jimmy Dean sausage, you know, rights and ballpark. When we were, when we were prepping, I was being a, a cranky old man by saying, I'm tired of going places where they say, oh, would you like the protein ball? I was like, no, I would like, I would like chicken and, <laughs> and some vegetables. Right. But to their point, Tyson's Donnie will not have the, the protein ball. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. You know, Tyson's not the company you would think about in your mind that you're getting like beyond meat, you know, and, and some of these alternative meat protein right. products. Right. But that's what they've done. So that's that's an interesting thing. So I remember back from business school, I'm sure you study this too, is how companies define themselves as important. So a lot of railroad companies at one time, they just called themselves rail companies. And um, as things moved to trucking, they didn't see themselves as trucking. We're just railroad. And I think I think there's a role for to stay in your lane, of course. But companies that define themselves a certain way stay on that path. And that's why, you know, we already talked about your, your why and understanding where you belong in this world. And, uh, yeah. And, and I think it's really hard because as growth happens, you kind of, the danger is I want to be all things to all people. You get complicated, you get complex and, that's right. and, and costs go up and quality goes down. That's right. So I think the lesson that we can really take away from here is that as I'm innovating, I'm innovating with my customer in mind. And so what is it that the customer comes to me for? With with that purpose in mind, too. Right? Yeah. This is who I am. This is my core competency. This is who my customer is. How do I serve that customer better? And then I'm really focused on that. And that helps drive a lot of the innovation that I drive. So we talked about a few of these. So first, we talked about the co-location, how I can collaborate with my my suppliers, how yep. I can innovate with my suppliers. They re- we're all close together. We've made a big commitment. We're all going to hold hands and sing kubaya. That's right. So, and, and you can't always do these things kind of remotely as much as we all like it. Uh, the second is really understanding their why. And you said these companies in this region have really done a good job of understanding their why and making sure they stay aligned to that purpose. The third one we talked about is, and this applies to all these companies, is they really innovate. Even though they, uh, they're they successful, they don't stop innovating. They don't settle with what they have. They're always looking for the next great thing. So what's another another lesson we can learn from Northwest Arkansas? Well, I know you and I talked about this a bit to kind of get on that collaboration side, but to build over to the culture side. And so, you know, the, this, you know, the story that I've heard since I've been here is that Walmart had an opportunity about 25 years ago 
where they were really trying to figure out, they're looking into the future, like we really need to attract good talent. And so, well, how do we attract good talent? And so and what that means is they understood we've got to pivot. Our way of doing business has to has to change. We can't operate the same way, even though our why is the same. We've got to innovate. We've got to become a more digital company. They really started seeing kind of, OK, there's this Amazon thing growing up over here. Right. If we're going to operate in the next 25, 50 years, we've got to be able to attract more talent. And so that means we need to be in a place that talent wants to live and work. So they were toying with the idea of this is my understanding. You can't, I can't, you can't put nail me down to the wall on this, but this oh, is no, I make I've stuff heard. up all the time on here, Donnie. Don't right. worry about well, it. Well, <laughs> and I'm, everything, I, everything I've kind of talked to different people, I believe this is true is that they were toying with the idea of going, moving to Dallas, which makes a lot of sense. Growth, marketing, a lot of talent in that right. area and moving their headquarters there. Great city. But my understanding is that the Walton family, who still has pretty good bit of influence here, right? Stepped in and said, no, we will make Northwest Arkansas a destination. And so they started pouring investment into the area. And so that's whenever Crystal Bridges, just a world-class museum uh, that rivals anything you would see. And in that's New one York. of the Walton uh, daughters funded that, I should say. That's right. Alice Walton funded it. It's free to the public. Mostly her personal art collection, but also they bring in exhibits. All it's just an incredible space. By the way, I saw an article in the Wall Street Journal about that not so long ago, and it is truly a world class museum. And I, I think this is so. This is you mentioned culture, but it think about the culture that Walmart would have had they moved to Dallas. And I, and who knows, it might have taken off and done even and been even more successful. That's hard to believe. But what's interesting is the, the decision to stay where they're at was say, hey, look, we're going to develop our own culture, our own place, our own community that we understand, that we get. Yep. Yep. And they, and they understood the talent that they needed to bring in too, right? And so all the companies did. So what do people want in general? And so if we understand we need tech talent, what are the things that tech talent really likes? And so what are the kind of cultural things in the area that they live that they want to have access to. Well, let's take advantage of our surroundings. We have the Ozark Mountains here. They're beautiful. Mountain biking. So all the whole biking community. So the Walton grandsons are big mountain bikers. So they started just building all these trails and investing in all these trails that's free to the public. And now Bentonville calls itself the mountain biking capital of the world. And they host people from professionals from all over the world. Fayetteville just a month ago, held the world championships in cyclocross racing and never been done in the U.S. soil. Right. And, so, and so there's all these mountain bike parks. There's road biking. We have the within an hour, you can do rock. I mean, you can do rock climbing here, but you've got the Buffalo River with kayaking, you know, world class hiking. And so they, they really took advantage of the natural terrain and the things that the community offered together. And really started investing in that together. And what just Walmart, JB Hunt's doing it as well. Tyson's doing it. Suppliers are doing it. They're all investing in the community. Now, what's interesting and what's great is that all these companies invest in whatever community they're in. They're all over the country, right? But I know that in my corporate headquarters that I'm going to have to bring talent in. I'm going to invest in the community. Why? Because people not only work there, but they live there. They play there. They want their kids to have a great experience growing up. They want their families to enjoy living there and have amenities that they can be a part of. And yeah, so I love, I, I love that they're not trying to be Silicon Valley. They're not trying to be Dallas. That's right. And, you know, I, I spoke to Craig Fuller on my podcast uh, a few years ago about why Chattanooga is the Silicon Valley of trucking. And he talked a lot about that, about Chattanooga. So it's always had a, a lot of trucking companies. And then because of some of the brokers that did, did done extremely well, it all of a sudden became this, uh, Freight brokerage place, then all of a sudden it blew up and became uh, a freight tech place. And then freight waves becoming basically the leader in uh, not not only the data, but also the media. It all of a sudden, it, it, it is attracting a lot of people. And I just had... Um, Matt McClellan on my podcast, and he was talking about stop coming to stop coming to Chattanooga because what was not so long ago a polluted backwater is now attracting companies and attracting people who say that that looks like a pretty nice life. And again, they've got the, some of the same natural beauty that um, you guys have down there, and they're taking advantage of it. And I think you know we don't all have to live in New York or Chicago or 
Silicon Valley to be successful. And I think there's a lot of people who, especially if you got some kids, you go, you know, I wouldn't mind having a little bit of land. I wouldn't mind having a, a little bit of uh, woods around me. A nice lifestyle. But I think this also speaks to the culture that the company was trying to develop, which is if we move to Dallas or we move to Chicago or somewhere else, do we lose who we are down here in Arkansas? Yeah, and I think there's a lot to that. One of the things that's been really impressive to me since I've been here is how many people I meet that move here, get moved here by their companies. Most of them are suppliers, right? So I got 1,500 suppliers here and they're moving people in and out all the time. But these people, once they get here, first they're like, where's Northwest Arkansas? Why do I want to live there, right? (laughs) And they get here and they start living and they start experiencing this. Oh, this is a great community of people who all do what I do. So we're all kind of connected anyway. They're turning down promotions to stay here. Right. They would just, if you can't, if if I can't stay in this role, I'm just going to go to another company because I can use my talent here because we're all kind of working on the same thing. So they're turning over, you know, so you're kind of constantly seeing this. But the other thing to your point that you talked about with Chattanooga, what is it, what is it attracting? And so here, along with this great culture, that, that has been developed around these companies and the way these companies collaborate together as well. Now we see a company or an investment firm or accelerator like plug and play, a Silicon Valley company that comes in here and says, we're going to set up our supply chain incubation place here in Northwest Arkansas because these companies, Walmart, JB Hunt, Tyson, Art Best, Georgia Pacific, who also has a presence here, are partnering with these startups. They're funding 60 of them per year to help that's them. That's part of get, that innovation. That's part of that innovation. So now as a big company, how do you innovate? I use startups. I partner with them. I let them come in. They can test and experiment with what we're doing. And so so that happened. And then you've got now drone company, manufacturing companies are moving here because, hey, Walmart's testing drones. They're using drones. <laughs> It just was announced, like I said earlier, you and I were talking about this mobility, transportation mobility. Huge investments are happening here in northwest Arkansas and companies are moving in. The governor, Asa Hutchison, just announced that a few weeks ago. That's a partnership between the university, Walmart, J.B. Hunt, Tyson and others that are coming in and, and funding and working together and collaborating with these things to solve societal problems now. So now it's not just, hey, we're working for the supply chain for retail. We're trying to figure out how do we make society better. So one of the things we didn't, we took, I think we came close to it, but we didn't talk about it necessarily is really understanding their market. So these companies that, that we just talked about really understand their market. And what, and I'll give you some examples from Walmart from my own studying. So I mentioned how 10% of all exports from China were to, to Walmart. That was good. That allows them to deliver inexpensive goods. I know here in Michigan, people are always like, buy American, buy American. But uh, And I'm not against that, but we don't make t-shirts here. We don't make ball caps. Uh, so so Walmart got flack for that. And, and I remember being at a Walmart and there was some guy walking through and, and his wife was saying, what about this? And he's like, made in China. Because he was, he's looking at t-shirts. And he's like, made in China. And I was like, I, I didn't want to interrupt, but I was thinking, Dude, they don't make t-shirts here. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, a, that's yeah. that's the problem. So you can buy a twelve dollar t-shirt at, at Walmart or make your own. Right. What was interesting about that is now you see, I've seen they have a big program to how can we make it in America. So they heard the market speak and they said, look, our our goal is to have this low price, and we know low price comes from China, but if we can develop some some suppliers here, some entrepreneurs here. And they can make stuff here for us. We'd love to say we buy American. So I think that's a fantastic listening to your market and making a change. Another thing, when they're getting a lot of flack for not paying enough for all this, they became really a company focused on sustainability. The nature of their business is not sustainability. I mean, when you're selling food and food and all the products they sell, people are going to throw that out. Stuff isn't going to end up in the landfill. But um, when I was still moving freight, I had a I had a solar panel company that we moved a ton of stuff to, and it was all Walmart buildings, Walmart high schools, hospitals in Vegas. We were, and so they get so this was a long time ago. Solar panels on all their buildings, and I don't know where that went. If they're still doing that, but their trucks that they made they are focused on sustainability because again, I think they they listened to the world, they listened to the market, and said 
this is what we need to do. That's right. And, and, you know, I think it's two things. So I listen to my customer, right? So I'm focused on the customer that tells me who I am. Right. And so this is kind of who, who we're going to be, how we're going to compete in the market. But then I have to understand the market, like what's happening in the market around me in our industry. And I can see kind of things that are going on there. And now if, if people aren't paying attention to now, Walmart has a lot of stores in China. <laughs> so, but if you're not paying attention to what's happening, in I China, never go. I never go to those ones. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and so, well, certainly they're they're the American dream company, right? And so here's a guy who started with nothing, dirt poor, grows up, build this multi billion dollar, maybe trillion dollar company, and well, he's expanding. By the way, let's think about this. The reason Walmart is what they are today is because they are within 10 miles of 90% of the U.S. population. Like their stores, they have the largest footprint in the country. They can serve more customers than anybody <laughs> else. In fact, if the, U, if the U.S. government had just kind of listened to them at the beginning and said, hey, why don't you distribute our vaccines? <laughs> it would have been done efficiently and effectively, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> that brings up another thing we talked about, again, listening to your customer. Healthcare is a healthcare costs and the hassle of it is a big problem here. You know, you try and get in to get a, a checkup or just little things. It drives me crazy. And my doctor's pretty good about this. But if you just said, oh, I got a cold and I just want some antibiotics, and you call and the doctor's, you know, office says, ah, oh, yeah, we'll get you in for a week, two weeks from tomorrow. And you're like, oh, I'll be, I'll either be better or dead by then. <laughs> right? So, so Walmart is opening up all these health clinics. And and it's cash only, and 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 I think a lot of this these I think the average visits less than like I think it's thirty dollars or something, and I don't know where those are located. They're not not by me yet, yeah. but uh, I also saw that from Meyer, which is just like uh, Walmart. It's only in six states up here in, mid, in the Midwest, but I got my flu shot there, and they also like said, "Hey, do you want?" You, they gave me my COVID shot and my flu shot. And that, they gave me a hangover without the booze. <laughs> but, but yeah, so it's all listening to that market. And again, I think these are um, these are great lessons. I, again, I think these are th four great companies. I want to summarize this, then I want to get your final thoughts on this, Donnie. I know I'm going to lose you. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> the topic is supply chain lessons from Northwest Arkansas. The first one is, Donnie explained what Northwest Arkansas was. So <laughs> first one is co-location. They, they got all their suppliers together and really with the idea that we're going to collaborate, big commitments were made. And, and and when you're close to your when you're close to your suppliers, you have the ability to innovate, collaborate, and good things happen from that. Secondly, you said they really understand their why. And in Walmart's case, which, which we touched on quite a bit, their why was serving some of the poorest people in this country. Number three, we talked about innovation. Even though these four companies we talked about, uh Tyson, Walmart. Mark Best and JB Hunt, they are always, always innovating. And, you know, if you're going to stay with that, uh, you're going to continue to be successful. You're going to have to innovate in this market. Next one we talked about was they really understand their market. They understand when, when there's a new hole develops in the market or they start hearing something different from customers, when they start seeing their world change, they change with it. And again, that was with Walmart, with the sustainability, with if we have to pay more to people, we're going to do that. The health clinics, just all these things that tell you they weren't staying the same. They said, as the market moved, we moved. Last but not least, we talked about just the cultures that these companies developed. And again, with Northwest Arkansas, they I love the story about Walmart potentially moving to Dallas. Even if it's not true, it's an interesting thing to think about. How, how did staying in Northwest Arkansas and them investing in that community like they have? By the way, guys, I've not been to Northwest Arkansas, but I might go to the Freight Waves Conference that's going to be down there not so long from now. Yeah, you need to. But if you just Google Northwest Arkansas, unbelievable pictures out online about that place. I think that must be uh, must be the tourist bureau down there. But all the, <laughs> all the cities that make up that region, unbelievably nice down there. And again, you look in... Again, freight waves and the guys that are doing logistics in Chattanooga. Same same lesson to be learned there. Yeah, is yeah. they they could have said we're going to move to Silicon Valley. Wouldn't that sound good that we're in San Francisco or we're in <laughs> one of those cities? But nope, they stayed they stayed home and they built a cool little world right in their backyard. And Joe, one point I would say about this, I tell people all the time, like this is what it looks like. 
when you have your major anchor companies in your community give back to their community, what it can do. I'm from I'm from Dearborn, Michigan originally. I joke about it. Every school I went to was named after a Ford family member. Every park I went to was donated land by Henry Ford. To this day, they're building a huge campus there because uh, they realized competing for engineering talent required them to have a campus, not the old style thing. And they constantly, Ford Land Development, which is still one of the largest land development companies in the world, spends big in not only Det- Dearborn, but the Detroit area. And by the way, when they built a, one of their electric battery plants out of our state, it was shocking. You know, yeah. It was like, yeah. oh my God, thank God General Motors kept theirs home. <laughs> but um, anyway, final thoughts on this. Put a bow on it, Donnie. <laughs> Well, and I think, you know, so for any listener out there, I think, you know, you know, we're talking about lessons from Northwest Arkansas, right? From, you know, three and four great companies that are here. But really, it's kind of this idea in my mind. And and it's honestly what I just said. If I can get really smart, great people to work together, collaborate together for the benefit of not only their companies, but their customers and their suppliers. And even more importantly, in my mind, their communities. Man, this is easy. I don't want to say easy. You have to have the right people. You have to have some serendipity in place, right? Got to make some money too. It doesn't work. <laughs> Got to make some money. But this is not rocket science for for how to cultivate this type of thing. And you've already mentioned that we've seen this happen in Silicon Valley with the tech industry. We're seeing this happen in Chattanooga. If, if companies can look outside of themselves, figure out really how to collaborate across the supply chain. That's what supply chain management is, Joe. We talked about what is supply chain management. Well, I had all these different functions in the in the company doing their own thing supply chain management how do i align them together to work together collaboratively and work across organizational lines collaboratively and now if i can do that then i can do that in my communities as well and i can make the world that we all work live and play in better together right and so to me that's the lessons that you take from northwest arkansas how do we win together excellent excellent so before you go are you uh, going to go to that conference when the uh... Freight Waves goes down there? I will. I'll be there. We we need to find each other. What date is that? It's in May, I believe. So what what I'll do is I'll put a I'll put a link. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. So anyone who wants to go to that conference. And again, I think this speaks to the success of Northwest Arkansas that Freight Waves is having an event there because it's May the 9th and 10th. May 9th and 10th. Yep. So maybe I'll see you there. I got a yeah. lot of traveling coming up this year. Got a whole bunch of weddings. So, man, it's hard to get to. That's right. Everybody's backed up from the past two years of not being able to go anywhere. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, anyway, what else is new over at, at University of Arkansas? Tell us a little bit about your programs, not just uh, your four-year degrees, because I don't think anyone's jump, jumping in on that just right. <laughs> well, our program is great. Uh, we got some world-class faculty here. Uh, I think we're... I can't remember the rankings that we are. I think we're in the top. I know we're in the top five of uh, publications, I believe. Uh, we're doing some great work around the intersection of, you're talking about healthcare, the intersection of policy and supply chain. Uh, we've been working on that for the past three years, uh, the research center with some folks, even at Michigan State. So Jason Miller up there, if you talk to him. Yeah, about Jason's it. been on the podcast so, a few times. He's excellent. And so we're working on that. We're working on some cool stuff. Some of our PhD students are working on some cool stuff on AI and uh, machine learning and its impact on forecasting. Uh, and that type of thing. We're doing some really cool stuff on a new initiative that we have is retail supply chain uh, initiative, look at, really looking at out of stocks and how retailers are kind of battling these out of stocks, working with that. Looking at, uh, we've got a, an initiative on supply chain, China relations. And so kind of what that looks like. We've actually been, uh, one of our professors, John Ken, has been working with Walmart doing a food safety program in China because Walmart's invested there so much. And so a lot of cool things going on. We, we've you got have certificate a great, programs there? We do have some certificate programs. Uh, you can look at those are in our exec ed programs at the Walton Supply Chain. We also have a Master's of Supply, Master's of Science in Supply Chain Management. It's an online supply chain with some face-to-face oh, nice. uh, components to it. That just launched this past year. We're in our second year, uh, Dr. David Dobrikowski. Send me those links and I'll put them in the show notes in case somebody's interested. The certificate program and the master's, it might be something that interests people, especially the online. I think that's 
that no one wants to move for a master's program. That's right. And to your listeners who are looking for some undergrad talent, we graduate 250 great supply chain students every year out of, as Gartner would say, the number one supply chain program in North America. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, it, it, it makes sense. I mean, it makes sense. That, I mean, it's funny. The universities usually take on the complexion of their of their their neighbors. And so obviously the companies we talked about today know a thing or two about supply chain. So it makes sense that it would rub off on the university and what they focus on. And the great thing about that is those companies give so much back. They're in our classrooms with us. They're providing projects for our students. They're giving opportunities for internships and work for them. So our students come out of our program well-prepared with industry experience, ready to go. Excellent. Donnie, thank you so much for taking the time. Joe, thank you for having me. It's been great. Yep. And thank all of you for listening to my podcast. Your support's very much appreciated. Until next time, onward and upward. You've been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage in conversation with experts in the logistics field. For more details, visit thelogisticsoflogistics.com or follow Joe Lynch on LinkedIn.